You're listening to the Maritime Gardening Podcast, episode 83, brought to you by Vessi Seeds and Safer's Gardening Products. Well, folks, today's episode is about companion planting myths, and who better to join us for this topic than author of Gardening Myths, author Robert Pavlis. Who is Robert Pavlis? He's a writer, he's a teacher, he's a speaker, public speaker. He's the author of Garden Myths, book one and book two, and also uh, a book called Building Natural Ponds. Uh, Garden Myths, book two, is a very recent uh, release. He's a blog host, the blog Garden Myths, and also Garden Fundamentals. Owner of a six-acre six botanical garden, Aspen Groves. Uh, he's also a YouTuber. He's got a YouTube channel, really good YouTube channel, called Garden Fundamentals. He's got more subscribers than me. Uh, excellent content and uh, definitely worth uh, worth a look if you're curious about the, the topics he's covering. Uh, Robert's more, uh, his content is, is broader than mine, so I, I'm focused on growing food, uh, whereas he's focused on, uh, so, to some extent, he talks about food gardening. We also have various uh, ornamentals and stuff like that, uh, whereas I don't have any content on that at all. So if you've got questions about your flowers or your bushes or your, you know, that sort of stuff, uh, Go to Robert. <laughs> he can. You could probably answer him a lot better than mine. I, I don't know much about that. Um, and uh, also, I've noticed that if you Google Robert Pavlis, the third hit is uh, Maritime Gardening Podcast Episode 71, <laughs> which was uh, uh, Things You Shouldn't Buy. Uh, so, uh, which was a great episode and we should really revisit that topic again because I, I, I thought that was a great t- uh, topic after my own heart because I'm a pathological cheapskate. So, uh, anything I shouldn't buy is something I want to know about. Um, anyway, Robert, hello and, uh, how's it going? Hey, welcome. <laughs> or, thank you. Um, it's going really great, uh, except for the weather. Uh, yes. We, we've had the worst spring in the last hundred years, <laughs> it's uh, super cold. It, it's July. It, sorry, it's June, and it feels like April. Um, our night times are cold. It rains every second day. Uh, it's just been horrible. And everything pretty much is three weeks behind schedule. I think. Wow. Are your um, like your your tulips? Have they flowered yet? Yeah, the tulips are out and they're finished. Finished. Uh, but finished. by now we're used to almost finished peony season, and we haven't started peony season yet. Uh, my vegetables are tiny little things because it's just too cold to grow for most things. You have and, uh, uh, you grow a bit of garlic. How how high is your garlic? The, the garlic actually looks pretty good. I think it's it likes all this rain we've had, and I think garlic probably likes cold weather for growing the green parts. Have they thrown up scapes yet? Uh, I haven't seen any. No, mine. Mine are about a foot high. That's about maybe a foot high. Uh, the big, the biggest ones. And uh, my 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 tulips are still flowering. Uh, some of some of my tulips are done, and some of them still have fully formed flowers. Um. Yeah. So, and also, you've been uh, fairly busy with your YouTube. I noticed you're putting about a video up a week. Well, I'm I'm trying to do that. Uh, right. Right now, I'm actually working on a new book so another i don't book. have any time for youtube videos yeah another book what's this <laughs> what's the next book about can, can uh, you tell it can you tell us or is this top yeah, secret this, we we finally have a title for it it's called soil science for gardeners okay and it's going to be a a, a pretty extensive review of everything to do with soil and how to improve soil and increase fertility and uh, it'll have a personalized uh a section in there so that you can analyze your own soil and then come up with a plan for improving it. I'll be the first book on the market for gardeners that talk about the rhizosphere, right. which is a special layer around the roots of the plants. Yes. Um, so yeah, it's it's an interesting project. That uh, sounds great. It should be out next spring sometime. Um, yeah, the books. Th- this is going through a publisher, and that's always a long process, unfortunately. Yes. Well, uh, today we're going to talk about your your uh, one of the topics that in is that's in your garden myths book. So you you sent me a copy of this uh, I don't know back in uh, the winter I as I recall or March or February, 
and I've, I've worked my way through it and uh, I sort of sifted through your book. Very, uh, I enjoyed the whole thing. I actually just finished reading it last week because I had, you know, sort of go slowly through these things. And there was one section of that book where you talk about uh, companion planting myths. And I thought this would be a good topic to wrap a show around. And just, just before I speak to that, I was also thinking that just to say that, you know, when you're an online personality like like myself and you've got people asking you questions all the time, uh, for me, it's, that's primarily on Facebook and YouTube. Um, and people will disagree with, uh, you know, people always want to argue on social media. And the wonderful thing about um, not, not so much your book, I mean, your blog content is mirrors your book content in a lot of ways. I can see following both of them that the one is almost like you're sort of testing things out in the one and, and it becomes formalized in a book. Uh, at least it seems like that. Um, it's been great for me because if someone wants to debate me about something on social media, I just tell them, the, I, I just, I'll, I'll, whatever that thing is, I mean, nine times out of 10, I mean, not that I'm always right or not that you're always right in particular, but I, I tend to come at, if I think something someone's saying is probably a myth, I'll Google, I'll Google that, that thing. I'll type the word garden myth and usually there'll be a thing in your blog about how that thing's a myth so <laughs> I'll, I'll just send I'll, I'll just say look read this and get back to me and you know and the great thing about what you write too is you're, you're not just some hack throwing stuff out there you'll reference your claim like you'll you'll reference whatever you referred to to make the claim you're making so it's not just you saying things you know repeating something somebody told you you're actually going to have some some kind of reference that backs up your claim um so it's got a little more validity uh so it's just a wonderful and for those of you out there that um uh, it, whether you're engaged in a flame war with someone on social media or if you're just curious about something someone someone tells you hey this this does that or this causes this or this does a bad thing with that uh i would say that it's an easy one-stop shopping to go to uh one of Robert's websites. The, the two blogs in particular are uh, Garden Myths and Garden Fundamentals. And the chances are, if something sounds too good to be true, <laughs> sounds fishy, there's probably an article there that Robert's written. Because is it the case that with, I don't know about both your blogs, but do you write something every week on each blog? Or, or do you want, do one blog one week and one blog the other week? Well, I try to post something uh, uh, on each blog once a week. I don't quite make that schedule though. <laughs> yeah, I that's know, what I I'd like to do, especially since I started the the YouTube channel. Well, then that takes a fair amount of time too. Yes. But I try to at least get a, a myth post out every week. Right. Um, and what I what I do with so like a lot of people will will also comment when I'm on social media and say, ah, oh, you know, I don't believe you. Well, a lot of the things I write about or things that I, I really don't know the answer to it when I start. Yes. So I, I don't, I mean, I maybe have a, a sense as to whether something's true or not, but I don't approach it from my point of view. And Garden Mess is, is never written on what my opinion is. It's always based on what I find. And as I do that research, I, I generally learn a lot and find out things I didn't know before I started the research. And then, then I write about it. I kind of wonder if it's true a lot of it seems to make a lot of sense some of it doesn't make a lot of sense but i really had no idea you know a year ago uh, whether any of it was true or whether it was supported by science and then i approach it i, I just ask a, a basic question and then i go and research that and, and find out what the experts say about it yeah, that that seems uh, at least from my reading of, of your the way you go at thing. Also, just you know, interacting with you on, on Facebook instead. I'll go on your thing once in a while. Uh, Facebook tells me when you ask a question, so if I, I think I got anything to add, and if I've got the time, I'll throw something in there. But you you tend to you know you're, you you seem to me like you're genuinely using a scientific method where you start with the question, not an opinion, and you want to answer the question. Uh, I think just today you threw something out, or the other day, or whatever you threw something out there about, um, oh, what was it? Um, whether uh, taking the scapes off of garlic has any impact uh, whatsoever on the yield. Right. And uh, you, you framed the question. You didn't, you didn't say, I don't think this works, or I think it does or not. You just said, does anybody uh, is anybody aware of any research that suggests 
one way or the other if this affects the the yield sort of i think i'm paraphrasing but i mean that's the way you pose a question and if there's there's no there's no evidence of bias in in the inquiry so that's you know i i that's, I, I find that very re refreshing in this in this field <laughs> for sure because there's a lot of opinions and not a lot of science and that sort of thing so uh, yeah that's great so speaking of uh uh, garden myths and especially uh, companion planting since we're going to talk about that today I thought maybe and and I've read where you've done this maybe you could you could uh, sort of educate or uh, inform uh, the listeners when you use that term companion planting can you define that term for us what do you mean when you're saying that what is the what is the common understanding of what that term means yeah so that that's really where I started because yes. I think we all have sort of a, a feeling of what it means. But the first question I asked is, well, what is it and what, how do the experts define it? And there are quite a few different definitions of, of what it means. But I finally settled on one that says, um, it, it's basically where two plants are grown together and at least one of them benefit by that association. Yes. And so the, the key is that a given plant grows better because it has a neighbor than without that neighbor. Yeah, so there's a, the one has an effect on the other. On the other. <laughs> yes. it, it, doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that they both benefit, but at least one of them does. Right? Yes. And that, that's a pretty, um, I think that's, a, that's something most, most people can, can agree on. And then you dig a little deeper and say, well, okay, well, what kind of benefits are there? And there's really a whole list of things. Uh, one of the things I find surprising, and particularly social media, is that people will have a discussion and say, okay, companion planning works, and the other person will say, no, it doesn't work, and, and there'll you know, be 100 comments about whether it works or not, and nobody takes the time to actually define what it is and, and what combination works. Yeah, well, um, people so that, don't like, even like, define when, their people don't even define their concepts first. I mean, that's social media right there. I mean, how can you possibly have an argument if we don't even uh, don't have common terms first? You know, right. So, you know, then I researched. Uh, well, where does this information come from? Did, did we do some research, you know, 100 years ago um, at, that led us to this point? And and as it turns out, that the whole concept was developed by a couple people writing some gardening books. And as far as I can tell, none of the information in that book is based on any science. Oh, it's just like folklore. It's just folklore. I see. Okay. So you you plant, some things go together, other things don't go together and so on. And there's lists and lists of these combinations, but they're not based on anything. There, there are no references. There's no science that went into to looking at that. So that, kind of makes the whole thing kind of suspect. But in agriculture, uh, there are cases where companion planting certainly works. Uh, one of the ones I, I wrote about many years ago was using marigolds for root nematodes. Right. And that's a very common thing to do is grow marigolds around your plants and, and it solves all kinds of problems. Well, with, with root nematodes, it actually does work. But when the scientists looked at it, what they found is, first of all, you have to grow the right kind of marigold with the right kind of plant. You can't just buy any kind of yellow marigold and have it work. They have to be species specific. The second thing is you have to plant the marigold not beside the plant, but right in the same spot as your future crop. And you have to do it in the same year. So I have to plant my marigolds and I have to grow them for a couple months. And that marigold attracts the nematodes into its roots. But the marigold plant has a poison that kills the nematodes. So the nematode population goes down. And then immediately you plant your crop in the same spot. In fact, in the same row. You, you can't even move over six inches because... It doesn't work. You have to be in that same row. All right. So it, it does work, but you know how many people live in climates where they can grow marigolds followed by their crop? 
Yeah, you'd be you know, sewing they, they, in they like work. late July or something. <laughs> yeah, so this works fine in in uh, uh, Florida and Texas and warm climates, but it certainly doesn't work in our kind of climates because we can't grow two crops one after the other. Yeah. Um, at least not most crops, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, unless unless you're trying to grow spinach or lettuce or something like that, you're kind of out of luck. Yeah. And then other people say, well, you put marigolds uh, beside it and and it it attracts um, pests like aphids and so on. Uh, but in fact, marigolds attract a lot of aphids to the garden, which then go into your vegetables. So yes. there's no real proof that um, they work as a as a, as a pest attract. Well, sorry, they do work as a pest attractant, but it doesn't reduce the amount of pests on your crop. And that's the key point that people kind of forget. In fact, a lot of research doesn't look at it either. I can put a plant in my vegetable crop and I can see an increase in pests. But the real question is, do I create a bigger yield because of it? Like, is there a real benefit? Yes. And well, the homeowners, they never measure the yield. Um, except, you know, a very, they get a very fuzzy feeling. All oh, this year's garlic was better than last year's garlic. But you, you can't compare year to year, uh, as we learned this year, because this, I mean, if you, anything you do this year different than last year won't tell you anything because our climates are so different this year than last year. So you yeah. can't compare year to year. You have to always have a control and you have to take your and split it in half and do something in one half and not the other and then you need to count them or measure them or weigh them or something so you guys yeah um, even when you when you sow the garlic you'd have to take count of the mass and the volume of the because the 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 clove that you you know like the bigger the clove generally speaking the bigger the resulting uh, bulb is sort of thing so maybe they're just bigger this year because the you you planted bigger cloves you know like you'd have to really set it up well um yeah yeah. So, um, so it, it, there there are certainly cases of companion planting that work. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Most combinations that you see in social media or in some popular gardening books have never been tested. Yeah, there seems so, to be seems to be an incredible amount of woo woo out there, and you know, especially like you mentioned uh, just just previously the. Uh, you know, I, people say this a lot because people will look at pests. I'll talk about pest damage in my garden and how I deal with it. But they'll often say, plant this thing, it attracts the pests away. And it's like they're running on the assumption that there's a finite, let, let's say we're talking about aphids, running on the assumption that there's 100 aphids in my garden and there's only ever going to be 100 aphids. And if I can get those, you know what I mean? Like there's a fixed population. And if yeah. I can just draw them over to the left quadrant where I've got this throwaway plant I don't care about, then that's fine. But it's, no, it's like if, if I'm giving them more things to feed on, I'm just going to be drawing more more aphid friendly. You know, more th- if there's more things in my garden that aphids like, they're going to be drawn to my garden. And I'm sure that's going to bring around more things that attack aphids and so on and so forth. But um, yeah, it's, it's it's there's almost like an infinite number. You you might as well think there's an infinite number of pests out there because you know to some extent you know in terms of your garden relative to your land there kind of is. Uh, so yeah, if you're just you know setting up some trap plant that that they you know they're gonna eat this you know the aphids don't know they're supposed to be eating you know mar whatever the thing is as opposed to your peas they don't know no one told them they're supposed to eat one thing more than another they're just going to eat that until uh it's all eaten <laughs> yeah. and they're going to have a and they're going to proliferate because you put all the stuff in the garden so next year you're going to have even more aphids it's very likely so uh yeah I, I, anyway i'm getting I'm, I'm 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 getting off topic here <laughs> the the other very common thing that people feel is that anything that's fragrant has got to work well as a as a companion plant so there's lots of stories about various kinds of herbs and i think that's where the marigolds come in so plants that have a fragrance somehow either attract pests or repel pests but if you grow these things with your vegetable crops um, you'll get bigger yields and from what i've been able to find there's very little evidence that any of that works. So all the 
herbs that are very fragrant. You would think they would have an effect in a garden one way or the other, but and they may have, but there's no evidence to support so yeah, I mean, fragrance they're... isn't really Im important. And and part of the reason there, I think, is that these plants are only fragrant to human, right? Or maybe some other kind of animals. That does not mean they're fragrant to insects. Right? Insects have a completely different way of detecting chemicals in the air. And it's, it's kind of like uh, comparing us to dogs, right? Dogs can smell all kinds of things that we can't. Right. So we can't sit there and say, well, marigolds are fragrant to us, and so aphids will find them fragrant as well. They might not. Right. right. Um, or they might find herbs, they, they stink and keep them away instead they of being might, nice fragrances. They might find th the things we find pleasant, they might find uh, repulsive. Uh, and of course, the flip side could also be true that, that plants that have no fragrance at all, as far as humans are concerned, could be very fragrant to a path. Yeah, and I mean, that's just the pest topic. I mean, the idea that some some ester that's emanating from a plant would affect, like I've heard the one where, and I don't know if this is the truth or not, maybe you could enlighten us, but the idea that, you know, basil, if you grow it with, and I'm actually doing that this year, but but just because I wanted to use this, I, I'm using this more of a, I, I tend to use what, what one might call a good neighbor's philosophy, just like there's space for that there, so I'm going to plant it. I don't, but there's a lot of people actually, I was just talking to someone, someone today was saying, that somehow if you plant basil with your tomatoes, it makes your tomatoes taste better. I don't understand how that could possibly be the case. Um, well, again, that's, that's a very common story that you hear. And I haven't been able to find anything that proves or disproves it. But when I have something like that, I, I always start with the logical approach and say, okay, I have my basil growing in a spot. For it to change the flavor of the tomato, what has to happen? Well, the basil has to create chemicals. It has to exude them out of the roots into the soil. They have to migrate across the soil to the tomato roots. The tomato plant has to absorb them, move them throughout the plant, move them into, to, into the tomatoes. And in fact, tomato plants, a lot of things in them don't move into the fruit. It stays in the, the leaves. And all of those things would have to work. And then there would have to be enough of that chemical doing that migration to, so that you and I can actually taste the difference in flavor. Yes. So the chances of that happening are, are pretty low, in my opinion. Well, especially if it's the, you know, if it's a scent, the smell, like... It, like, it, let's say the smell of the basil does something. There's a chemical in the air. I mean, th that smell, that, that can, whatever is making that thing you're smelling, that's not being uh, excreted from the roots. That's, you know, like, that's an, that's an air thing. So yeah. how on earth would it, like, get sort of sucked in by the tomato leaves and get you know, put into the, I mean, I, I suppose it's possible, but it, it just seems very, uh, very unlikely to me. Um, is I suppose you know like if if you've got mycorrhiza filaments in your soil, perhaps the one plant's plugged into the other one in some roundabout sort of way, maybe I don't know, but um, yeah, it's it's hard to understand. You know, like and and again, I can't see as you're saying, I've not found any sort of uh, article or research or experiment that showed that. Also, you know, for to to, to go with the basil ex uh, uh, example. If it was the case that it had some sort of fundamental effect on flavor, wouldn't you think that tomato producers, because, you know, basil seeds are relatively cheap to obtain, wouldn't they just throw some of that around and let it grow with, uh, with the tomatoes if it made it taste way better? Um, yeah. You know? Yeah. So the, the, the classic example of uh, companion planting is the three sisters agriculture. Yes. Right, where you grow corn... Uh, uh, squash and beans and the uh, the squash shades the soil and keeps weeds from growing the bean stalk allows uh, the bean to climb up and get sun and the bean produces nitrogen because it's um, a legume yep. and that extra nitrogen goes into the corn and we know corn is a nitrogen hungry plant and that that sounds really great so I started looking into the three sisters 
And it turns out that this is a, a way of agriculture that the North American natives were using. And in fact, they did use it but quite differently than the way it's described. And they would plant those together on a, on a quite a large hill. And they did it mostly because it was a very easy way to cultivate a new area. If, for instance, they wanted corn, they would grow only corn because they got more corn when they planted just corn than if they planted all three vegetables. Right. So although it, it historically has been used, it wasn't used to produce a lot of food. Um, it was used for convenience sake. But now if we have a look at the system, it sounds really great at, at first, but if we look at the system, well, it turns out the legumes do fix nitrogen, but they keep it all for themselves. They don't share that nitrogen while they're alive. And in fact, the legumes move that nitrogen into the fruit. So if you harvest the beans off a plant, almost all the fixed nitrogen is in the beans that we take away. There's very little left in the plant. Right. So the beans are not giving the corn any nitrogen. And the squash, in fact, the squash that the uh, that was used historically, it was actually pumpkins. It's not the cultivars we're using today. And they're very hungry for water. And in fact, they would compete with both the bean and the corn for nutrients and water. Yeah. And so there's been very little studies of anyone using the modern cultivars for this. But some people have gone back and sort of did a historical study and uh, actually planted historical cultivars to see if the system works. And in fact, what they find is there's no increase in yield whatsoever so as far as a companion planting goes there's really no benefit i i have to admit i i i was enamored with this concept and i tried it in my garden years ago and uh, I, I, I don't do it now because i didn't get the results i mean it worked but the corn doesn't grow high enough to produce a satisfactory trellis for the beans mm. and uh and the and, and 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 just as you're saying it's not um you know, uh, just in terms of what I get back, I, I didn't find it to be optimal. It, it, you know, it, it would be a good, I mean, squash is a good way to, you know, like if you've got a, I, I'm even doing this this year, if you've got a, a patch of ground that's relatively uncultivated, um, you can make a mound of squash and let that foliage go everywhere and it'll it'll sort of, you know, uh, it'll, it'll shade all of that ground and it'll outcompete just about everything in its orbit sort of thing. So it's kind of handy for uh, claiming ground in a sense, um, so it does have that advantage. But yeah, and the idea of a uh, a companion um, that the one's benefiting the other in, in in the way that you defined initially, um, exactly. I mean, again, I think this might be one of those cases where maybe the corn and the beans, if you planted them together, they'd be good neighbors, right? Because the the corn grows. If you were corn and bush beans, perhaps I, I'm trying this this year, corn and bush beans, and I think because the the corn is higher. If you planted, uh, you know, some rows of bush beans and maybe the corn a little bit north of that, uh, the corn's higher, so it's going to get its light. The bush beans are going to get their light. Um, the bush beans, let's let's say they're nitrogen neutral because they're sort of making their own nitrogen. So all the nitrogen that's in the soil is sort of a, a, it, the, the beans aren't really competing for it. It's 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 the the corn can get it sort of thing. But that's again the. It doesn't mean the beans are providing it for the corn. They're just good neighbors. Um, so, you know, that, that, you know, that, that makes sense to me. But, yeah, there's no magic. Uh, I don't think there's any magic going on. Yeah. The, there are some other um, examples that do work well in that, uh, for instance, if you plant lettuce, you generally plant it early because it likes to grow cool. And then if you you grow some you know, beans or corn or something in front of it so it provides shade, then the lettuce will last longer and you can get a, a longer harvest out of it. Yes. Um, so there, there are cases where we do that uh, more of a succession type planting or cases where crops don't like the heat of the summer and we use shading. But those actually don't really fall into the, the benefit of companion planting. 
exactly. That's, that's more of a case of just planting them in the right spot so they benefit from from each other. That's like um, I'll I'll jam things in between my garlic sometime, but it's because the garlic don't cast shade. So yeah. you know if you've got a tomato or more like a, a kale or a lettuce, and you you need to stick your let's say you're thinning out your lettuce and you got to stick them somewhere. Now jam them in between my 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 uh, my garlic because the the garlic are the roots are deeper anyway and they're not really casting a lot of shade and the lettuce isn't going to be there long anyway because it, it you know it's only around for a month or so and then it bolts and you got to pull it anyway so um, it's just just good neighbors you know not necessarily the one providing any uh, I actually just did a, a YouTube uh, video very recently uh, speaking to the and I used to subscribe to this idea. That if, if you had things like a like a brassica, like a kale interplanted with garlic, uh, that the garlic will somehow confuse pests and keep it off your kale. I used to think that worked, but it's mainly because I was growing garlic and kale somewhere where there wasn't much of a pest problem. Uh, <laughs> I tried to do it here. It didn't do anything at all. Um, I also used to think that, um, you know, like you were mentioning uh, marigolds before. I mean, I think that's evolved to beyond nematodes i mean i've read all kinds of uh posts on on facebook people just telling everyone to put marigolds with everything and somehow that'll solve every single problem and i, I had that one year and i was i would go out in the garden at 5 30 in the morning and the marigolds were covered in uh slugs <laughs> they ate all the marigolds and then they moved on it's almost like they liked them the most and then when they finished killing my marigolds they ate all my kale uh, <laughs> didn't do anything to stop the uh, and the same thing with the garlic, you know, like the, the slug will go along and take a bite of the garlic, doesn't like it, moves on to my kale, eats my kale. Um, so, yeah, I've that that one in particular, that garlic confuses pests. Um, I have not seen any evidence of that at all. Yeah, there, garlic and onions are potentially good companion plants. Uh, because they do produce sulfur compounds and and those do go into the soil so there is the potential there that those might affect soil-borne organisms right but again there there isn't a lot of testing that's that's been done all <laughs> the, the marigolds again uh, one of the problems with them is that apparently they attract thrips which I've never had a problem with in the garden but they will actually bring them into the garden and then they can attack your your vegetables. What's a thrip? Uh, it's a, um, a small insect, somewhat similar to an aphid, um, but they're they're more fly they fly more than aphids would. And the thrips are beneficial, or they're no they no they they can be a problem for vegetable uh, for for various kinds of vegetables. And uh, the, the problem is gardens tend not to have very many of them until you start planting marigolds. And then <laughs> they, they apparently really like marigolds, so they get attracted to that. Right. Yeah. Um, There's another thing in your book you talk, I mean, this is a bit, it's not really a companion. This, I guess, is something that might be a companion for a person. In a lot of my videos, people will see, you know, my garden borders on a forest. And, uh, and the forest has a big bog sort of very close to the house. You could, it's a stone's throw away. Is it what they call a bog here? There's no, no real water, but it's wet. And uh, I'll be up in my garden, especially this time of year, and I'm just being swarmed with black flies. And uh, I'll have people telling me, just grow some lemongrass or, you know, grow this flower. And somehow, you know, uh, this, you know, like, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you've ever, I can't, or what's the citronella supposed to, you know, put, well, you know, Grow a little citronella, and then uh, you won't have one million black flies in your backyard. Yeah. And uh, I got news for everybody. It's not going to do anything. <laughs> and you, yeah, you, I, you say the same thing in your book. I haven't really looked at black flies, but I spent a lot of time looking at mosquitoes. Right. And uh, because they do sell the, the citronella plant to ward off mosquitoes. Well, it, it turns out that the, the plant they sell is not even the citronella plant. So the citronella plant is actually a grass. It's not hardy. The citronella, oh. that, that's the real citronella. That's where citronella comes from. The plant that they're selling is a geranium that kind of smells like it. Just so a lemony smelling kind of thing. Plant. 
<laughs> uh, so when you go in a nursery and you see these big signs about mosquitoes and the citronella plant, it's always the wrong plant. You're right. Uh, the, the only plant I found that will ward off mosquitoes is a eu eucalyptus growth. Right. So you can grow a forest of eucalyptus that that works. Yeah, if you put it, eucalyptus oil on your skin, it, it it actually works. You know, such a strong smelling oil, you can get it at the drugstore. It will. Uh, they don't like that too much. Uh, I don't know how long it lasts, but it will yeah. repel them. I, I've experienced that. Um, but it's it's not cheap and it doesn't last as long as something like DEET. No. So the there are some essential oils that do work, but there's two things to note. Is is one is that they're all short lived, so they have to be reapplied about every two hours. Whereas a, a good deed will last you six to eight hours. And the other thing that people don't really realize is that many of these essential oils have not been tested to see what they do to your skin and your body. And people think, well, these, these are natural products, so they've got to be good for you. Or at least they won't hurt you. And that's simply not true. So things like deed have been tested, you know, for 50 years. And they haven't found many side effects to DEET. People won't use it because it's synthetic. And yet mm -hmm. they'll go and get some eucalyptus oil where they know very little about it and use it thinking that it's perfectly safe. So the best products really for mosquitoes and black flies are the commercial preparations. Right. Uh, DEET is very good. And the other one is uh, Picardine. Uh, which is more popular in Europe, but I think is starting to make inroads in North America. Hmm. And those products actually do work. Uh, well, also with these things, especially with black flies, I think a lot of people don't realize that. Like even I've I've got some I've got some of this uh, deed stuff I got on eBay back back in like the late '90s, early 2000s, when you could buy anything on eBay. It was amazing back then. And I got some DEET from like the Korean War, like in a green container, <laughs> like something a, a GI would use. And I don't know, it's must like, I don't know what, I think it says 90% or something like that. It's strong. Mm -hmm. And uh, that stuff works really well. But even with that on, and I've worn it in my garden, the flies are very bad in my garden. And I'm also an avid angler. So I'll go out in the middle of nowhere where the flies are really bad. Like, and, uh, you know, these bug repellents, when the flies are unbelievably bad, especially with black flies, because they swarm, like it's not, it's, there's a cloud of them around you. Um, they they'll keep the black fly from biting you, but they're still around. I mean, they're they're following your you're you're making a trail of carbon dioxide. My understanding is that's what's drawing them to you is is your breathing. You got to stop breathing. So as long as you're breathing, they're they're gonna find you, and they're around. They're around your face because your face is the breathing part, and they're, you know, they're trying to go in your eyes, they're going in your nose, they're going in your mouth, they're going in your ears. And the, the bug repellents just, they're going to land on you and they're not going to like that. So they're going to leave. When, when you first apply it, if you've got really strong stuff, it creates like a little force field around you. They won't even land for a while. But after half an hour, they're going to start landing, but they won't bite you because they'll land on your skin. They're like, oh, God, this is the worst I've ever, you know, what is this stuff? And they'll leave sort of thing, but they'll still land on you. So even after half an hour, they're they're all over you and they're all around you sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, imagine just, you know, being three feet from a, a flower. That'd have to be some flower. <laughs> yeah. When you're like well, coating your body with some, you know, toxic chemical that that's, you know, it's, it's toxic, but it won't kill you, you know, unless you were bathing in a bathtub full of it sort of thing. Um, even with that on, they're around you, right? They're really close. Yeah, again, this this gets back to this issue of, of the quantity of the chemical. The dose. So when, when we take a plant, we extract the essential oils, we're concentrating those those ingredients down. And so you put it on your skin and you're adding a, a, a tremendous amount of chemical compared to the amount that a plant gives off naturally into the air. Yes. And the amount that plants give off is so small that it really doesn't affect the insects. And so there's there's nothing you can put in the garden that's going to reduce uh, the mosquitoes and black flies. Although there's lots of people that will swear up and down that they work. Well, I think this I mean this comes to a kind of a theme of this show, 
is is just that I mean, and gardeners are more prone to this than a lot of people. Oh no, this is a very human thing. Just that 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 general uh, logical fallacy, that post hoc reasoning, that that idea. And I even did a podcast on this that probably had the least downloads ever. But the title was uh, "Post hoc ergo propter hoc." It's a it's a logical fallacy where people, you know, it means like before this, therefore. Uh, you know, or is it after this, therefore, because of this? I think that's the translation, meaning thing A happened, then thing B happened. So thing A caused thing B. And that's a very natural conclusion to arrive at. But that is not how, you know, if you're trying to defend uh, a causal connection, that is not how we establish cause. It's one part, that sort of temporal priority. You know, this happened and that happened. Okay, that's step one. Maybe something's going on there. And then you have to establish that the two things, uh, you know, they have covariance, that when one thing changes, the other thing changes. And then you have to establish that uh, you have to eliminate all other plausible explanations. And that's where people usually fall completely flat. Uh, you know, what was, you know, there could be some other thing, is compl- some third thing or some fourth thing that's actually causing the effect that you think you're observing. So, you know, all of these things, you know, if someone puts some oregano in with their, uh, uh, zucchini and they have a really good crop of zucchini like ah i have it it's oregano it's the oregano and it's like no you just could have had a different variety or it was a good year for zucchini or <laughs> like it's probably not the oregano it's making your zucchini huge this year uh you know but it's something at gar and, and if, if, especially with gardeners if something works um if, if they think something works they will never ever change that thing they'll just do it forever you know, okay. stand on one leg, you know, for, you know, sacrifice a goat, whatever, you know, like <laughs> whatever seems to work. If they think it's going to work, they're going to do it forever. Um, and they'll just keep adding things to the list of things that seem, you know, based on one experience or one observation. Uh, certainly. And, and, and that's probably all these things. And everybody wants to have a really good result. Everyone wants to have a good garden. So anytime anyone says do this and that will happen, everyone believes them and does it. And if things work out well, they think that must have been the reason. So they go and then they perpetuate that thing and the next thing. And it just, you know, uh, it's, it's, a, uh, you know, it's a very natural thing for people to do. But I think a lot of people do a lot of things that are really not having any effect at all uh, because they believe they do. Mm-hmm. So I, I have a question for you. Yes. When you plant your peas, do you yes. soak the peas? Uh, I don't. I mean, I, I, I give them a good watering when I plant them and I leave them in the ground. That's it. Interesting. I don't soak. I don't soak anything. I, I just everything goes in the ground. I actually do a modified. I haven't done a video on this, but it's almost like a modified bagging method for certain things um, that need heat. And, you know, so I like for a squash, for instance, um, and maybe for a pea, uh, I, I did some peas this this way this year. I'll, I'll put the pea in the ground about a, a, an, an, an inch deep. I'll water the ground and I'll put plastic right on the ground. So that way it doesn't need to be water. It will not dry out because I'm sort of sealing it. It'll be just flat on the ground. And then uh, after about, you know, five days, I start checking it every single day. To say, as soon as I see a sign of anything, I have to get the plastic off. Um, but it's uh, anyway, to answer your question directly, yeah. No, I don't. I don't soak peas or, or anything else. Despite a lot of people, a lot of people seem to swear by it. But and I, I, I keep meaning to do it. But uh, to tell you, it's just pure laziness. I, I just jam everything in the ground, and it seems to work. Well, I, I, I never bothered soaking my peas, and then a couple of years ago I started because the peas are really shriveled when you get them in the package, and I thought, yeah. well, it makes sense. And you're sowing very early when the ground's really cold. So I thought, okay, you know, that way you get a couple days in, in the house and it's warmer. So I've been soaking them. Yep. Well, this year I decided to run a little experiment to see if it actually works. Okay. So what I did was uh, I, on a certain day I started my peas and put five in a pot in a, a planted pot with my garden soil. I took another five and put well, actually 10, and put them in a dish for soaking. After an overnight soak, I took five out and potted them up. And then the other five I left in there until they started to germinate. Left in what, the soaking solution? Yeah, and it's okay. just water. Yeah. So I was testing no soaking, a 
you know, a 24 hour soak and about a three day soak. Soak until the radical appears or the beginning yeah, of germination. Yeah, the, the, the skin was just breaking and you could see the radical coming out. So it never actually okay. came out. Right. And it turns out that the, the best germination was with no soaking. <laughs> and the tallest plants was with no soaking. And in fact, the 24 hour soak produced the smallest plants. Hmm. That's interesting, eh? Uh, so it was, it, now if we look at that as a little experiment, uh, I had controls and I did duplicates. I did them in pots because that way I can uh, monitor them better and treat them all the same way compared to putting them into a garden soil where the soil at one end of the row might be different from the other end and so on. Right. The number of peas was pretty small. It was only five. So that's really not enough uh, to give you any kind of statistical accuracy. Yeah. And it's going to do a T test on that. Uh... <laughs> yeah. So, but what it did, what I think it does show is that soaking certainly didn't improve things. You know, the, the longer soak seemed to be about the same. The, the difference in height wasn't dramatic, but it really looked as if soaking did nothing for for the peas right, right. so I, I probably next year we'll we'll try the experiment again with a, a larger batch and do them in the garden right and right now I'm doing the same thing with beans to right. see if if uh, it has an effect on beans right because a lot of people people don't soak beans as much but a lot of people do soak the peas right. and again people will swear that you you know you get better germination and better growth and so on um, I think I think a lot of people like it's it's really important when you're when you're gardening especially if you're trying to grow food right because you, you've only got it, it matters right you're looking forward to these fresh beans you're looking forward to the lettuce and if if you lose your season you're, you're sort of you were really looking because the, the, the stuff you grow tends to be better than the grocery store stuff and and it's so abundant and it's so fresh and you're growing different varieties than the ones they sell and you're really looking forward to it and I mean, you'll you'll do almost anything that increases your confidence that it's going to work. So, you know, I think a lot of people, they'll they'll soak the, the pea or the bean or whatever, because it's going to give them more confidence that what they they, they believe in it. Right. So they, they're more confident, uh, whereas you just stick it in the ground. Oh, God, is it too early? Is it too late? Did I you know, did it get enough water? Have I watered it enough? You know, you're so worried about all that sort of stuff. Um Certainly for me, I would say the best way to get your a good germination for your peas is you sow them as soon as the soil can be worked and put a plastic dome over that garden. And you're basically, if it's if it's April, the garden's behaving like it's May. And you don't want to get too hot in there, but you put a plastic dome. My, my peas are almost two feet high now because they've been growing since the last week of March. And it, it took them forever. To, it took them three weeks to germinate because it was just so damn foggy. There was no sun, right? So the mm -hmm. dome doesn't do much if you haven't got any sun working on it. But they, they did germinate and they grew and you know they're they're you know they're 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 well on their way now. Um, but it's because it was moist, and it was warm. <laughs> it, yeah. it was moist enough and it was warm enough for a bee to germinate that sort of and the other thing about having the, the plastic dome or some sort of microclimate like that is you're you're creating a bit of a biodome so that the, the, it doesn't evaporate the same way if it was just exposed to the air because it's you're creating kind of a closed system do you, do you sh share a lot of your experiments on, online well I, I will write it up as a blog post okay so I did the I did the experiment and I have the pictures. I just now have to get around to writing it up and right. posting the results. Right. And then I'll do the same with the uh, the bean experiment and see right. how that goes. Right on, man. Well, uh, okay. have we uh, hit every possible uh, myth we could on uh, companion planting? Well, there's probably lots more. I, I just can't find any data to, to say anything one way or the other. Yes, exactly. But that's the main thing. I mean, like, uh, you know, I would encourage people that to, to do your own little experiments and, and set aside a little part of your garden and just don't do that thing that, that you think is going to do something and see what happens. See if there's any difference at all. Um, you know, it's, it's always good to do these these little experiments and try different things and evolve um, just, just because, you know, your uncle tells you something. 
that word for him. Your uncle could be wrong. I'm sure he's a great guy, but your uncle could be over that. Uh, your uncle, aunt, whatever. But, you know, just because someone tells you something, it might be true or it might be based on, you know, just some something that just seemed to work one year. And so people stuck with it and it may be completely superfluous. All right, Robert. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for coming on again and talking about this. We'll have to think about doing a, uh, an episode uh, at some point about, uh, I don't know if you've continued to uh, identify uh, things you shouldn't buy. But oh, I, 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 love- think, I think we can come up with a list without any problem. <laughs> there, there's so much stuff out there that uh, you shouldn't buy. Yes. Regard. Yeah, that would be a good program, I think. Yeah, no, I'd love to do that. People are always telling me because they'll see me put uh, seaweed in my garden, and they like they'll ask me, where can I buy seaweed? And I'm like, I only use it because it's free where I live. <laughs> I would never buy like I would never buy that ever. I, I think I just said that in a video right recently. Like, no, I'm I'm using it because it's free. That's it's not. I'm not using it because it's magical and I would pay anything to get it. Uh, it's free and it works, but you know, if it, if I couldn't get that, I'd use some other free stuff like yeah. bags of leaves. Yeah. I did a post once about fish fertilizer and, right. and some people think that it has some magical powers. And I basically concluded that, you know, fish fertilizer is a, a really expensive nitrogen source. Um, and I, you know, I wouldn't use it. And then there's some uh, ecological reasons too, because they actually go out and harvest real fish out of the ocean to make some of the fish fertilizer. They're, they're not using fish leftovers always. And that's someone not, had posted. That's not good at all. And, no, it is. No, I, I, I really surprised me. Uh, the Alaska fish fertilizer, they actually go out and harvest the fish. Right. And they consider it's it's not a good fish because you we can't use it for food but a lot of the animals and, and larger fish in the ocean use it as food and then we make fertilizer out of it so that that's not a good thing I had a, so someone posted in and said well i i live by the ocean and i i get all these dead fish off the beach why shouldn't i use them and i said right. well you should use them there's nothing wrong with fish fertilizer or or, or whole fish um if you if people ask me you know what is the the best a- amendment for the the soil well i always tell them the cheapest one because it usually means it's a waste product and it also means it hasn't been transported around very much right a yeah. lot of our costs are transportation or, or packaging that's right. so the lower the price it probably means it's local and hasn't been transported too much and if it's or, uh, an organic material it used to be plants or animals it's good for the garden use what yeah. you have Anything yeah. that'll go in one end of a worm and come out the other end of the worm is going to be good. It's going to uh, be good. <laughs> I had an uncle uh, in Newfoundland. In Newfoundland, they have this fish called a uh, capelin. And mm-hmm. I guess for people that don't live by the sea, they, they look like a smelt. They're like a, t- a small, tiny fish, maybe, you know, the, the, the a hand span long, let's say, give or take. And uh, these fish uh, spawn on the shore and, and millions of them uh, just uh, end up on the shore dead and so they'll go around and scoop these up with tractors and i had an uncle that ordered uh, uh in newfoundland some capelin as fertilizer for his garden and uh one morning you know he just heard the beep 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 and a dump truck <laughs> dump, <laughs> dump truck full of these dead fish and he had to bring in every relative. He, he, was, he wasn't even a fairly a young man when this happened. He had to bring in everyone in the neighborhood to, to deal with all these fish. There were seagulls everywhere. The smell was horrendous. You know, so. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, so that's this, this uh, unique part of that's one thing that people in Newfoundland will use is a, what they call the capelin. Um, I wish uh, I wish we had them here. That certainly uh, I like eating them. <laughs> but Anyway. Right on. Well, thanks for coming on the show again, Robert. Uh, uh, people uh, listening to the show, if you enjoy the show and you want to support the show, uh, check out the description box. Uh, if, you're, if you're listening on YouTube, check out the description box or check out the show notes and you can get the, the details for the coupon codes from the sponsors. If, uh, if they sell something that you want, buy it from them and that'll help support my show. 
Robert, it was great having you on the show once again. I'm so uh, grateful that you uh, you give us your time and uh, give us all of your great uh, advice and wisdom and help bust all these garden myths. Uh, I'm so glad you write these books and I'm so glad you provide the uh, the blog and the YouTube channel and all those different resources. Uh, I encourage anyone uh, that's interested in this sort of topic to, to look that stuff up. Well, thanks very much, Greg. It was great to be on the show again. Thanks a lot. And I look forward to... Uh, Telling people not to buy a bunch of products. <laughs> music to my ears. Music to my ears. All right, everyone. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, you know, it's great, uh, great having you listen to my show again. And uh, until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden. Thanks for, thanks for listening. Thanks a lot, Robert. Oh, no problem.